Hello, I am Fantastic and Fantastic, and today I'm going to talk about the Yu-Gi-Oh! collab that has come back to North America for the second time. So, this collab as a whole still has value to be found if you are a new player who has never rolled beforehand. The reason for this is because every single card has a weapon assist, which in turn makes it more valuable to roll because at least they will give some value. And if you're a newer player, there's a good chance your monster box is starved for weapon assist, and a collab that gives out weapon assist is going to be meaningful. Furthermore, there is value to be found at both the seven, six, and five star rarities. And for myself, I still use the Karibo Weapon Assist on a modestly regular basis because it does provide quite a bit of nice utility and Fortress Dragon from time to time. And with this in mind, I just want to take a look at all the given cards for this collab overall and hopefully give you some insight or direction as to where you should be spending your magic stones. And if you did spend your magic stones here, what the cards may be useful for. So, as mentioned already, what is useful for this event is that there are weapon assists for every single card. There's value at all rankings. If we just take a look at the five star rarity rankings for myself, I believe that Karibo is definitely a wonderful weapon assist to pick up, and if you get one, you shouldn't ever be disappointed because I still find myself utilizing them, and Fortress Dragon is a nice haste stick, Gaia is a nice button, but I'll get to those a bit more detail later on. And another interesting aspect is that all the cards feature eight latent slots, and this gives them a distinct edge because you can now use the super latents, so the latents that take up six slots, along with two SDRs alongside of it, which just gives them a bit more value overall compared to other cards who only have six latent slots. Unfortunately, there are obviously some natural drawbacks of any given event, and for this one here, you cannot monster exchange for any of the six star cards, which is a shame because there are some six star cards that have value. And there are no new bottom rarity cards, and it does provide a lower motivation to roll again because, like for myself, I rolled this event reasonably hard prior, and I've got all the five stars and multiple copies of each one, so it does definitely lower the motivation to roll again a subsequent time. But if you're a newer player, this is a great time to roll then. So, in terms of who is valuable, it's naturally going to be more top-heavy event with the seven stars taking up two, and then Exodia being the six star, who is a dream card, but only really dreamy for Phyllis teams. If you don't have Phyllis, it's definitely going to be a bit of a drawback. And then you get going down further and further, but for myself, I like to always look at the bottom rarity, because it definitely gives me a bit more idea of what to expect because you can cater your expectations so 40% of the rolls will be actually a five star card but amusingly enough the six stars take up half the rolling pool so there is still potentially some new things for me to find so I may still probably end up rolling but I'll talk about that a bit more later but with that being said let's just take a look at each of the individual cards so we're going to look at Pegasus first and Pegasus in his base form can transform after a 20 turn cooldown with one skill boost in the base form and when you do transform you get two turns of damage immunity so if you have other things that have to transform later it does act as a like a kind of buffer for damage so to speak and once you do transform you have 10 two sevens and a vdp so you've got significantly high personal damage with a large attack set i just want to clarify almost every card in this event seems to have incredibly high weighted stats and it's definitely quite a nice thing to have because these cards just bring a bit more value in those regards but once they do transform, they have a two-turn cooldown that unlocks all orbs, creates five darks over non-heart orbs. And then it locks all the dark orbs. So you unlock, you make dark, and lock dark. So you counter locked orbs, then you make orbs, then you counter spinners. It's a pretty cool thing overall. And as a leader, they are a reasonable leader for the most part. These numbers, I think, are just calculated wrong because if I'm not mistaken, it's for all aspects of dark cards. But... The point of the matter is the multipliers are reasonably nice assuming you have lots of balanced god and devil type cards in your team you get large amounts of bonus combos and you might think this is definitely a strong card it is i'm not going to argue it's not but there is a bit of a drawback like it is an orb skin so you have to roll them there's no skill mine resist which may or may not be a problem and there's the big opportunity cost of not using his weapon assist which is really his best form and this weapon assist gives you a single skill boost 40% jam, jam resist and 40% poison resist. So these are nice awakenings. Like it's a nice way to help cover additional resist when you're using other things in conjunction alongside of it. And the active skill is actually the main appeal as well because you get 
to cut your own health. And whenever you cut your own health, it means the cooldown of the active skill is shorter, which is in our favor because healing back up is really not that much of a penalty. In all honesty, anytime I see cut your health by a certain amount, I think that's a cooldown buff much stronger active skill. And in turn, it turns out it actually is. You also get one turn of 100% damage reduction. So you take no damage for one turn. That's a shield that is mandatory to bring in SR2 and SR3. So the two current end game content dungeons, you need a shield. Now you have a shield, this is great. You also have three turns of damage absorb shield effects being canceled. So damage absorb is needed for at least two turns in Shura 3. It's not needed in Shura 2. And the way the spacing is actually going to be based on the weapon assist, it's going to be good timing for Shura 3 because this weapon can solve your damage absorb problem and your damage reduction problem from the boss later on because the damage absorb is needed for floor 6. So it's combining two mandatory aspects into a single weapon assist. This is definitely quite meaningful. Obviously, you don't get the damage absorb benefit for Shura 2, but you still get the shield effect, which is nice and which is needed, I should say, along with the awakenings. And even for like things like Shura 1 and below, this is still a reasonable 13 turn cooldown, so you still can definitely utilize it. If you are so like any monster box will greatly benefit from this weapon assist in all honesty. And the main drawback is it is an orb skin card, which means you have to roll them or buy them with real life money. Depending on your current situation, buying with real life money may be a viable option, but at the same time, if it's not, it's gonna be difficult to roll and you cannot monster exchange for them. And that is what the orb skin looks like. Next is Yugi, who is the star of the Yu-Gi-Oh collab, big surprise. But unfortunately, I don't feel like he just lives up to like the protagonist's potential, so to speak, because he is strong. Maybe I am undervaluing a bit, but I feel like it'd be like, a high A, a low S ranking overall because he does good things, but he's not as amazing as other things currently are. So if we look at his base form with one skill boost is a much bigger improvement compared to before you get to transform. And after 20 turns of waiting, you become a massive VDP damage solution. You do four VDPs, significantly high amounts of personal damage there. Some rows bind immunity, etc., And the active skill has actually become significantly stronger as well. You get to change fire, water, and all hazards into dark orbs. So a wonderful orb generator. You get plus two combos, which may or may not be useful. And you get also plus three combos, I should say. And then you also get two turns of damage absorb cancellation. And this is a six turn cooldown. This is completely ridiculous. If you really think about it, Pollone gives you one turn of damage and color absorb, so I guess it's a little bit different, but Yugi gives two turns of damage absorb and an orb generator and bonus combos. In terms of like raw value tied into an active skill, this is one of the highest value actives you can have. And this damage absorption is great for Shura 3, it's great for Shura 1 and below, it's basically good for every dungeon but Shura 2, so that's a pretty good coverage overall. And then as a leader, they give they're immune to poison damage and they give three times stats to devil types. So that means each individual Yugi gives you three times health, 27 times attack multiplier, and six million auto fall attack when you match five or more connected dark orbs. These are thick multipliers, but the biggest problem is there is no damage reduction component tied to this. And right now, the hardest dungeons tend to feature exceptionally large gravities, and gravities that exceed 100% of your current health pool. So you need this damage reduction, or it could be gravities followed by a hit. So you need to find damage reduction. Like Natsuro does function at the moment because, well, Velkana and then the new Kaiba give large amounts of effective health as well. Yugi doesn't have the greatest pairing possible. They can pair with like the Fate Sakura, who which gives 65% damage reduction, but in terms of raw effective health, you're still miles behind Nautilus and Royal Oak, and that in turn can make it so these large hits may be much more difficult to actually survive against. But don't get me wrong, it's still a strong leader skill, but it's not in the same tier as like Nautilus, Royal Oak, or the Seven Star Fairies. Like it's good, but nowhere near as elite overall. And another thing to keep in mind is that they don't have personal damage without a VDP, which may or may not always be available at every given floor, so that can put some constraints on how much damage you can deal on a regular basis. You probably have cards you can definitely compensate and make up for it, but it's just something to be mindful of. Now, if this leadership potential and a damage absorb solution has no interest in for you whatsoever, you may want to take a look at their evolved form because their evolved form can have super blind resist, which is great, and two 10 combo awakenings. So 27 times, no, 25 times personal damage along with 4,700 plus attack stat. 
That's a massive attack stat with a massive personal damage multiplier, and it makes him a great candidate for the double damage cap latent, and that means he also can have two SDRs alongside of it because he has eight latent slots. So you have a card that's going to be hitting tremendously high amounts of damage on a regular basis, giving super blind resist, and an active skill that's actually meaningful. It gives you a full HP heal, which is probably irrelevant, but it removes all Awoken skill binds which is nice. It doesn't remove unmatchable, so you have to bring another cleric-style card on your team to deal with that mechanic, or if it's not a relevant mechanic, then you can ignore it. But you also get a delay for two turns, and that two-turn delay is valuable for transforming any other card. It's basically trans like converting him into a four effective skill boost card, because we're not taking the skill boost plus super awakening, we're taking the 10 combo super awakening. And you also get to change the top row to dark, bottom row to light orbs. So you have quite a powerful active skill it gives a lot of different components and there's a good chance you're going to be able to benefit from at least one component of it and that is definitely meaningful and the biggest drawback is you don't have skill binders this and you obviously compete with the transforming form if you don't have any strong leaders you should be using yugi as a leader because you can roll basically his whole like a team that's going to carry you through content from this event so if you rolled yugi there's a good chance you pulled those fortress dragons and maybe dark magician alongside of it but the point of the matter is if you need a sub that does quite a few valuable things make the evolve form need a leader or something that counters damage absorb make the transform or keep it in the transforming state his weapon assist, it's, I guess, nice, but compared to the other forms, they're just no, it's nowhere near as competitive. Like, tape resist is just not necessary. Like, nothing really needs tape resist. Like, I'm talking about, like, Shura 2 and 3. They don't need tape resist. You really don't. I don't bring tape resist, and I'm okay with it. So, I don't think it's necessary to take up an awakening, or a latent, or like, an inherited slot with this. The rows are cool. The active skill is nice, but the point of the matter is I don't think it's worth it if you only have one copy. And if you had two copies, I'd probably want to use, still use Transforming and Evolved Form still. Next comes to Kaiba, and Kaiba has five unique evolutions. And I'm going to just touch the less important ones very quickly, such as his base form. Like, it's a cool row-based card with large amounts of damage reduction. You might think you can pair well with, like, Natsuro. Like, it's possible like you get auto follow up attack you have to match six or more connected water orbs synergistic overall but like it's just not as strong as his other forms they don't give any personal damage out of vdp which can be a bit of a hindrance because their other forms have significant amounts of personal damage their blue dark form got a greatly upgraded active skill and it gives you super poison resist well sorry they're sorry the active skill gives you one turn of 100 percent damage reduction so we need shields we've already established we need shields so you have a valuable active skill right away it also gives you one turn of damage absorb void da one turn of damage absorb void is not going to be enough for sure three it's irrelevant for sure two but the damage reduction is still meaningful you also get a board unlock and then converting the whole well making 15 water and 15 dark orbs which means on six by five you're guaranteed a 15 15 board split which can ensure lots of vdps or two vdps technically or a dark vdp of like combos or sorry water vdp with rows etc like you mix and match various patterns you can do some cool stuff with that and that guaranteed consistency is nice so you got four skill boosts you got large amounts of personal damage with their high base attack as well as a vdp super awakening super poison just they're a pretty well wrapped up card and their leader skill is basically the exact same as their base form except they give bonus combos instead of auto fall of attack which may or may not be relevant depending on the type of team you're playing with for their new uvo form or ultimate evolution form this form is going to be the strongest leader overall because of the awakenings and the active skill they bring it's just the whole kit is just stronger overall they have triple seven combo and an l awakening along with a vdp super awakening so these are great offensive awakenings and they have 5320 attack because why not they also have 8290 health like huge health even huger attack because yes let's just make them super stacked they also have two enhanced water combos, which makes the damage of the entire team go up by a noticeable amount. So you have a card who's going to easily hit double damage cap because you have eight laden slots and they don't transform. You can also get two SDRs as well. You have a card who's also going to get passive damage to your entire team. Their active skill gives you three turns of 50% damage reduction. You have a shield for Shura 2 and 3 that lasts for 3 turns, which means you have even more wiggle room. If you misjudge or miscount like Hexazeon's like 50% threshold or the turn timer or Gil's 50%, you have that extra safety net of more turns of shielding so you don't end up dying. 
That is great. You also have three turns of three times attack for water. That is nice too. You also have a delay for three turns on a 14 turn cooldown. So Kaiba is pretty ultimate right now when you think about it. Like you enter a dungeon, you delay, you can transform everyone else in safety. Later on, you can delay more floors if necessary or put up a shield if danger has arisen. You get to the boss, you can shield through their big enrage hits. It's just everything you really could want in a card, so to speak. Huge personal damage, team damage, L for utility, an amazing tri-benefit active skill. Amazing overall. As a leader, they give 2.2 times stats for water cards, and then the total attack multiplier is 484 times with dual leaders, because math is hard in my head. 22 times. And they give 25% damage reduction per leader, as well as 12 million auto follow-up attack. So, you can definitely utilize them as a Natsuro pairing, because, like... You're going to have ni like nice bulk. The damage reduction is lower. It's going to be lower compared to Velcana, but Kaiba brings much more to the table than Velcana as a card. Velcana's active doesn't really solve many things. Kaiba's active solves so many things. So, like, if you're star for team slot options, like, Kaiba would possibly take out Velcana as your Natsuro pairing, potentially, because he just brings so much to the table through his active skill, because that delay helps you transform in greater safety, so on and so forth. And the multipliers are big. You get big auto follow-up attack. You've got some damage reduction, at least, but the brute health you're going to have between the two leaders is going to be quite high. So a powerful leader, powerful sub, powerful water card all around. This is going to be my preferred form to pursue if you're not interested in his weapon assists. And another thing I want to mention is, despite the fact that you think the damage reduction component is low for Natsuro, which it is, his own innate shielding active kind of greatly offsets that. So those big gravity-based hits that come up every once in a while, you can deal with due to the 14-turn cooldown, and it's not inherent, so it comes up reasonably fast. For their first weapon assist, this weapon assist has been like, I don't know what to inherit on my team, and I'm going to use this, because I don't know what else. I've covered everything already. Because it gives you skill boost, team RCD, team health. One and a half seconds of orb movement time. It now also gives you that same 100% damage reduction shield for one turn. So that's an active you actually need. The bicolor board generator, as well as one turn of damage absorb void. It's doing so many different things. It's not necessarily the best at any one given metric, but the fact that it's giving many different beneficial aspects makes this a wonderfully nice weapon assist. My biggest complaint right now is I only own one Kaiba. I haven't done some rolls yet because I plan to roll later on in my stream, but... I wish I had more Kaibas because I would love to use more weapon assists because I truly want to use this form because I can make more blue teams and I just love blue teams and like they, I like blue dragons. They say blue and dragon in their name. So yeah, of course I want to pursue that. But point of the matter is this weapon assist is great because it does basically a bit of everything and it does a bit of everything quite well. So it's a nice, I don't know what to inherit, inherit. His second weapon assist is much more streamlined to mono water teams, and I feel like you might as well just run him as a sub or a leader instead because the active skill is the same as his Uvo forms too. So I'd rather just run him as a sub leader because it's so good. Like, I don't know what card would inherit this that it's going to take my team to a higher level than actually just running him as a sub directly. Next, we come to Merrick, and Merrick in their base form has TPAs, and TPAs do get buffed, and their massive attack stat, lots of seven combos, means they could deal large amounts of personal damage against all spawns, except Void. But the problem is, all dark teams right now like to be blob-based for the most part, so it's going to be hard to find your TPA when you're matching rows or VDPs already. So kind of awkward right there off the get-go. Their leader skill has reasonable multipliers, but they need a healing solution, which Gung Ho Blau just really solves, but it's nothing special. You need two dark combos. It's anti-synergistic with being able to blob with Rose because like Yugi and like various Yugi pairings just dish out more damage more efficiently, and it's just a little unfortunate. But their active skill is reasonably strong if we had a good place to use them. It gives you RCV and an attack buff, a board unlock, changing wood to dark, and water to heal orbs. That's a tremendously strong active skill, but the problem is the body itself is just a little awkward. No to truly use it. Only gets two skill boosts. The, it's just not going to stand out compared to other options. Their evolved form is definitely a better iteration of them overall, and I would pursue this form in most cases because it gives you two 7 combos and a 10 combo. So 20 times personal damage against all spawns with a monstrously large attack stat. 
great things overall. You also give super jam resist two seconds of war movement time because that is nice. And you also have a full cleric style active skill, which means you remove all binds, awoken binds, and unmatchable effects while also giving plus two combos and one turn of void damage void, which helps rainbow teams pierce through anything that would have required a VDP for mono color. This is definitely still a disadvantage for rainbow, but at least it wraps up nicely in an active skill that is useful for many other aspects. In all honesty, Merrick or would have been much better if Gungho Belial didn't exist, but Gungho Belial is just simply superior in virtually every way. They have a five turn cooldown for a full Clary active skill, not 10, five, 10. Five is so much faster. It's a big deal because current end game content tends to have lots of back to back, or at least not just like back to back, but like say floor X and then X plus two or X plus three, where you need awoken bind clearing again. So Merrick may force you to stall, which is can be dangerous. Whereas Gung Ho Blau can be just blitz through and it's ready again. Definitely a drawback there overall. They also cover the exact same colors. So if you're trying to do all attributes for sure, three Gung Ho Blau is just gonna be a better choice. And it's just, a shame because I definitely feel like Gung Ho Blau is a bit of a mistake in terms of just being too strong overall that she's used all the time, even on off-color teams, just because of what she brings. But the point of the matter is Merrick lives in her shadow. If you don't have Gung Ho Blau, Merrick definitely has more merits. But at the same time, I wouldn't be super invested in trading in for him because even so, it's still a 10-turn cooldown for a full cleric active skill. And do you have any great dark team that can truly take advantage of them? Maybe, maybe not. As a leader, they have... A large health multiplier, but no RCV and no damage reduction. They also give no sky faults. It's just not really going to happen. It's rainbow. Rainbow's awkward. Their weapon assist is a full cleric style weapon that gives you cloud, a time extend, plus, and skill bind resist. Like, if you don't have any full cleric style active skill, this is nice, but it's not worth trading for because there's a six star card that does almost the exact same thing through a weapon assist. And if I did have a Merrick, I'd probably just keep him as Yuvo form because, like, if you didn't have Gung Ho Blau, obviously a bit more merits there, but I don't know. I just feel like this is not a cleric active I'm going to pursue. I'm still going to utilize things like my Christmas Tamadra over this. Now we come to the six star cards, and the first one is Exodia. And Exodia in his base form gives you 100% blind resist as a weapon assist. Pretty cool. Only card that gives 100% in a single jammer, poison, or blind metric. It is cool. The active skill, which you're going to need to remember for all the other forms, gives you one turn of damage absorb void, which is great for most content, and then one turn of void damage void, which is also meaningful for certain teams, and then 10 times attack for light and dark, because why not 10 times attack? That means if you're a light card of a dark sub attribute on a light based team, there's a good chance that dark sub attribute is going to be dealing a meaningful amount of damage. It can add up. And now let's think a little harder about, let's remember this and then take a look at their evolve form because that's the form you should be pursuing. This is nice, but nowhere near as nice. So Exodia in their evolve form gives you two skill boosts and they can have five crosses and they can have potentially two more skill boosts or a seven combo. Even without the seven combo, they're 97.7 times personal damage versus all spawns. What the fish? That's amazing. And then we look at their attack stat. 4,785. So, double damage cap shouldn't even be difficult for this card. Like, it really shouldn't be. Monstrous attack set, the highest, basically the highest personal damage multiplier you can imagine. And the right colors for Phyllis. And if you have Phyllis, Exodia is a best in slot sub. In fact, two Exodias are best in slot because in Shura 3, you need two turns of damage absorb cancellation and they can go back to back. You also have two cards that are guaranteed to hit double damage cap on their main attribute and their sub attribute has a large amount of damage as well. In fact, when you use their active skill, there's a good chance you might double damage cap on both main and sub attribute. Like, damage. And you might think, like, is... Like, we do a lot of damage. This is damage on a new level because you're double damage capping plus even maybe an extra damage cap from one card. Two on the team. You're out damaging with two cards more than some teams in total do. And Phyllis is still going to be damage capping and probably even like your Daffodil and maybe whatever else you have on the team. Like, it's going to be pretty amazing overall. And the biggest problem is you have to roll them. You can't actually monster exchange for Exodia, which is definitely going to be a bit of a drawback. But remember that active skill I talked about? It's meaningful because it voids damage voids. So VDP is a problem for Phyllis teams because they like crosses. They don't tend to have VDP. Exodia solves that. Now you don't have to use like other inherits like, say, Rudra's inherit. You can just use Exodia directly. 
It's a lot of solutions in one card. It just makes Phyllis become one of the absolute best leaders in the game because she now has a sub who just does basically everything in the context of Shura 3, especially if you have two. Their second weapon, like I mentioned, you want two for Phyllis teams. And if you have Phyllis, you want to have two of them. So I wouldn't even really consider their weapon assist. But like it is same powerful active skill. Gives you bind immunity, gives you team HP, team RCV, and a skill boost. So pretty nice awakenings. But the opportunity cost of not using this base form, I feel, is, is just a bit too high overall. And now no other six star is going to be as exciting by comparison. And Weevil is definitely at the bottom. Because Weevil self-delays your other active skills which I think is truly sad. It gives an attack buff, and that's it. Just an attack buff for a four turn cooldown. Nautilus is a two turn cooldown with a probably a much stronger attack buff, generates orbs, and doesn't self-delay other people. I have no idea where I could truly use Weevil efficiently, unfortunately, and I just think that's kind of sad. Like Maybe like if you have nothing else, and you're really desperate for something to stick on a team, maybe. But it's only two skill boosts, so it's not even that high either. And the personal damage is probably not going to be that significant. Because if you're a new player, not, if you have Nautilus, Nautilus is doing more than enough damage probably with like just one other sub. So it's probably not relevant for the type of content you play through. So like, I feel like it's just a sad and underwhelming card overall. And their weapon is this similar idea. Like, the active skill, you don't want it to overcharge. And unless you're going to benefit from 60% poison resist and the three rows, there's no merit to this weapon because you don't want the active skill. And if you don't use all the awakenings efficiently, it's an inefficient weapon overall. Next is Rex Raptor, who's also a new card and also a disappointment. They have four skill boosts and large amounts of personal damage with a TPA and their 10 combo, but... There's no place to utilize red TP at this point in time. Their active skill does give you two turns of delay, so they are a six effective skill boost card, but remember, you're just a skill boost stick with a board changer and a delay. You're not doing that much else for a given team, I feel, overall, so I feel like they're a bit of an awkward card. Like, they don't cover new colors for Rosalind teams if you need for sure a three. Like, I don't know, I guess you could match TPAs for Rosalind teams because the seven by six board gives you that leeway, but like, you're taking away another sub slot, which is like, it could have been possibly someone else. I just don't really feel like it's gonna be hard to really incorporate them into a given team. Like maybe Rosalind teams, like I said, if you don't have anything else available, it could work. But I feel like if you have more fleshed out boxes, you don't necessarily want to use them because they're more about like just the upfront value as soon as you enter the dungeon. A delay of a board changer is nice, but it doesn't necessarily counter that many other mechanics potentially later on. For their weapon assist, they give Bind Immunity a single TPA and two team RCVs. Maybe if there's a TPA team in the future that needs healing solutions, this could be a good weapon assist and they can benefit from the active, but right now it doesn't fit anywhere at this point in time. Next is Summoned Skull, and Summoned Skull is interesting because they have huge amounts of personal damage against god type spawns because of triple god killer. They also have a 10 combo, a 7 combo, and a VDP, super jam resist. Pretty great stuff overall. Their active skill is a five turn cooldown that gives you an RCV and an attack buff based on the number of physical attacker or devil types on your team. So you could, doesn't matter even if the multiplier is not that high, the fact that you can buff two stats on a five turn cooldown is meaningful and you are also able to make light to dark. That is nice. Sophie does like Sophie does a similar role, but Sophie gives time extend. And the time extend, if it's not necessary, is not going to be helpful. I'd prefer to have Summon Skull because the same number of skill boosts, but Summon Skull will have BDP, which means you could hurt those void spawns. And there are a good chunk of gods in Shura 3, so maybe I could argue that maybe Summon Skull could have some merits on there, but I'm not sure. I don't have one, so it's hard for me to tinker around. And dark teams, I feel like, are a bit of a disadvantage right now for Shura 3. It's just a little hard to play with them at this point in time. But that being said, I think Summon Skull is pretty cool overall for how much damage you can deal to gods. And even without god killing damage, it's got 7, 10, and a VDP with a reasonably high attack stat. It's not a terrible thing overall. Their weapon assist gives you nice amounts of passive damage and that buffer as well as an orb generator. It's not bad, but for myself, I tend to not have that many free weapon assists. Like I tend to prioritize covering and addressing mechanics before layering and passive damage. So unless I've covered all the necessary mechanics I want to cover, I'm not gonna look into a more offensive oriented weapon assist because it's not helping me transform, it's not helping me survive necessarily. The buffs are nice, but maybe you have other buffers present, who knows? But the point of the matter is I feel like 
like it's just gonna be a little hard to bring as opposed to like delays or haste or something else just to get you transforming, get you going or something to counter certain key mechanics like damage absorb. Next is T and T in her base form has a full cleric style active skill, but they don't really serve much purpose at this point in time in this form. They do have six skill boosts. They do have three team RCVs, but like it's not that magical overall because their weapon assist is a full cleric style active through a weapon. So remember, Merrick is the same idea, but a higher rarity. If you roll T, you don't need to make Merrick's weapon assist and you don't need to trade for him for sure. You get two skill bind resist, which is relevant because like the fairies don't have skill bind resist. So this definitely can be a way to patch that up and upgrade a full cleric active skill from a card who didn't have a full cleric ability. It is nice and it also gives you ability to refresh the whole board so it can deal with like a full board of poison so you know oku and shura too well that preemptive woken bind and full poison board is completely countered by this shining friendship card pretty cool thing overall like it's just a nice thing to have potentially so i think it's a nice full cleric style weapon assist it's not acquirable by a monster tr trading but if you do roll in this event there's a good a modest chance you will acquire her and it's going to definitely be a boon to most given monster boxes Joey Wheeler in his base form has lots of L's and nowhere to truly utilize him, unfortunately. So I'm just going to jump to his better forms because like talking about underwhelming stuff is probably not interesting to you as well, potentially. His Uvo form, which is new, gives you super poison resist, a 10 combo, 7 combo, an L shield, and 2 L's. So that's actually a large amount of personal damage with a VDP or a 7 combo super awakening and a large attack stat. A nice solid damage dealer definitely can make a good use out of the double damage cap latent potentially for your Rosalind teams. And the active skill has value potentially as well. It has one turn of Dark Orbs unmatchable. So if your team is not dark, you've countered unmatchable. It's a convoluted way to counter unmatchable, but it still works. Because if the opposing spawn says unmatchable for like say X turns for hearts, well doing this overwrites the unmatchable of hearts with your own unmatchable. It's a weird counter. Not the best counter, but it's a counter. You also get to have one turn of damage absorb void and then three times attack. So you've got a seven turn Fujin style active skill that doesn't transform. That's pretty fast. You can attack buff and a weird unmatchable counter. So pretty cool thing overall. A good solid damage dealer for your given team. Super poison resist, four skill boosts. Pretty nice card overall. And the only thing I feel like is... Their weapon assist might be a bit of more competition for their second form. Their first weapon assist is just an L, bind, immune, and skill bind resist. They have a 200 times button, but I don't really think 200 times button is going to cut it. They do make rows, which might be useful, but I think as an overall valuable weapon, I feel like the second weapon assist is more meaningful because it gives you an L, which you need on every team, so having one is meaningful. You've got physical killer, which is helpful for things in Shura 2. Highly relevant, there's a lot of physical spawns. Team HP helps you hit health thresholds, a jammer resist, why not? And that same seven turn damage absorb counter active skill. So I would inherit say blue samurai three quite often, but not I don't necessarily oftentimes always need the skill boost or I don't need the um jammer resist. So I can have a one turn cooldown shorter option for that sort of um, for countering damage absorb and I also have meaningful awakenings as well that could possibly cover other things I'm not here's my, I'm not trying to say that like this is better than blue samurai 3 it just gives you the option because both fulfill very similar roles but give different awakenings depending on your team one or the other may or may not be better just be mindful that one turn of damage absorb is not sufficient for shura 3 and has no merits in shura 2 and I feel like this would still be their most universally strong form unless you have a dedicated mono fire team that can abuse their new Uvo form. For my Valentine, I think she's just underwhelming. You get physical killers and two heart L's. And like, cool, you could do like large amounts of damage to physical spawns, but you don't hurt anything else. You give two turns of delay, so you could be a six effective skill boost card, which is nice. But again, you just are a skill boost front loaded you're basically a skill boost transforming solution that doesn't do much later on. If you play through harder content, it's just not going to be enough to carry you through it potentially. So I feel like that's definitely a bit of a drawback there overall. And I feel like the weapon assist is probably a bit more unique. It gives you follow-up attack, which is probably potentially quite rare actually if I think about it. There's not many weapons that give follow-up attack. Most teams have a way to deal with resolve anyways, but maybe the team you're playing doesn't, and it's nice to have an option. It gives you some movement time, and it gives you two-turn delay. Not the best delay, highly situational weapon assist overall, but I feel like it still probably has more merits unless you're starved for any way to transform for, like, say, Nautilus teams as a newer player for Mono Wood. Bakura is Poison Damage Dealer, and Poison Meta never took off. 
when he first came out, it was cool at first, but like as soon as Yugi's hype faded and just other or just other dark cards became available, Bakura I feel like just kind of lost some value. They do deal sick tremendous amounts of personal damage when you match poison orbs but the thing of poison orbs is you need to have someone who doesn't get harmed by poison orbs dino and yugi can do so but it's just like you're clogging up your board unnecessarily for yugi teams dino teams won't care as much because they're matching poison orbs anyways but yugi teams will so it's a little bit awkward i'd say overall and it's a bit of a shame because like it's a cool concept, it's just there's not enough things to support a poison meta. They also give you four skill boosts, they give you a super blind resist, and a four turn board changer, so you can inherit something over top of it to give you whatever value you need up front in the dungeon, and a board changer as you go along. So, like, it, it's strong in theory, we just don't have any good poison team to take advantage of them, or just poison teams just are not going to really take off, I feel. Their weapon is this gives you bind immunity and the super and the poison blessing, which is just a dream for their own base form. They are vulnerable to binds, they don't have skill bind resist, so this weapon assist solves some of the problems and gives even more personal damage. So they can be dealing massive amounts of damage with those poison matches, but I just feel like it's just clunky and cumbersome overall. Next is Dark Magician, and Dark Magician has the ability to delay enemies by three turns. And he also has four skill boosts. So it's a seven effective skill boost card. They give two seconds of ore movement time and super poison resist along with double seven combo and a VDP with a reasonably high attack stat. So he's a nice all around useful mono dark sub, but I feel like the biggest problem is he overlaps so much with Alitu, but Alitu just has a better delay because Dark Magician gives you the delay and then changes, well unlocks, which is different, but he changes hazards to dark and that's it. Alitu gives you a board changer of water, fire, and dark. So that board changer is going to be better than no effect. And the personal damage, like, Alitu has some personal damage. Not as much, but a better board changer overall. So I just feel like Dark Magician is cool, but, like, Alitu covers water, if that's important for all attributes, and just a better active skill overall. And both have eight latent slots, so they're just equal in that metric. For Dark Magician's weapon assist, he gives you skill boost and then three miscellaneous niche killers those niche killers might be helpful in some cases it's never a bad thing it's still a four effective skill boost card because of the skill boost and three turn delay so it does have value and merit there for blue eyes white dragon you have large amounts of vdp damage with a large attack stat but it's kind of awkward if you don't do anything else but vdp damage i feel overall and the active skill does give you bonus combos one turn of damage absorb void which is nice on a nine turn cooldown along with creating a column of water and a column of light orbs so it's an orb generator and a damage absorb solution on a nine turn cooldown it is nice but it's just nowhere special at this point in time one of the blue fairies at six stars gives you a very similar effect when they transform so it's just like okay it's like not that magical overall no skill binders this is definitely a bit of a drawback like a lot of the popular mono water teams are lacking skill binders this due to natsu or even using gung-ho belial on it and even more cards of no skill binders this is going to be a bit of a problem overall so it's an okay card overall but nowhere to truly take advantage i feel unless you're farming certain content because then their weapon assist is an inherit which gives you bonus damage when you're above 50 percent health it gives you Enhanced water orbs, good for like mono water swipe farming, not a bad thing overall. Now we come to Dark Magician Girl, who is basically Fortress Dragon after they transform. Fortress Dragon is a five star card, but when they transform in game, they become Dark Magician Girl. But Dark Magician Girl, if she's used directly as a sub, gets to use her super awakenings, which I guess are cool. You could have more skill boosts, but Fortress Dragon gives you more skill boosts with their haste. They give you six effective skill boosts. Dark Magician Girl will be four not so great overall and mixing rows is never the best of things their active skill is definitely much stronger it's a three turn cooldown that gives you a board unlock and then creates five light and five dark orbs and three hard orbs as well so it's a pretty nice orb generator and a board unlock but it doesn't necessarily counter much mechanics necessarily and fortress dragon is better for farming purposes usually because three turns of haste with three skill boosts is going to be superior to most likely whatever you're going to have even if you inherit amatsu's loot that's like the big extreme scenario you would have more skill effective skill boosts here but less haste which means you may not be able to recycle actives because haste is valuable in farming builds because let's say you use um chuan who has a four turn cooldown you use dark fortress dragon right after 
you now have got that four turn cooldown down to one turn. You match that row that was just made and it's ready again. Recycling active skills is important and why Fortress Dragon is stronger overall. Her weapon assist mixes two different color rows and there's no team that can take advantage of both. So it's just by default going to be a sad weapon assist unless you need bind immunity and skill bind resist. Now we come to the five star cards and Gandora is sadly a little underwhelming. Like they do have reasonable personal damage, but three attack wall below 50% is nothing special. Their attack stats not that high. Team HPs are okay. Some five skill boosts can be nice, but like it's just nothing great. It gives you an attack buff. But it doesn't make orbs, so I don't really foresee much usage for them. Their weapon assist gives you two team health awakenings. If you have no other weapon assists that give team health, this is nice. But there are 34 other cards that give two team health or more from a weapon assist. Good chance you have at least one of those. So, underwhelming card for that reason overall. Gaia the Fierce Knight has magical amounts of personal damage against Devil Spawn. Super blind resist, so... You can use Devil Killer Latents, so like you can have a Devil Devil Killing Stick. That is nice for certain situations, but their active skill gives you a 1 million button damage to all enemies, ignoring defense. This is great for farming purposes, especially with their weapon assist, because one skill boost on a card may be a little awkward for button teams. Even in co-op, might possibly be a little awkward, maybe, maybe not. But point of the matter is, with their weapon assist, if you want a button, this is the way to go. You need a Devil Killing Stick, use base form. Button, weapon. Because with the button, through their weapon assist, you can inherit it on top of something else. So you can ensure you have lots of skill boosts on a given team because it's much easier to work with a sub with lots of skill boosts than something with one skill boost because it helps all the other cards as well. So great button for farming purposes because one million damage is great as well as generating a column of wood orbs twice, four times, four columns of wood orbs. Lots of wood orbs are appearing on your board. Pretty magical thing overall. Next is Mystic Elf, and Mystic Elf misses the mark, unfortunately. They have some personal damage. They can clear Unmatchable, but that's kind of it. They make a Column of Hearts. It's nothing special. It doesn't accomplish anything meaningful, I feel, overall. Weapon Assist does give you 80% Jammer Resist. So again, if your monster box is more shallow, you have no way to cover Jammers, boom, you have 80% coverage. And remember, as a 5-star Rarity card, there's a good chance you're probably going to acquire at least one when rolling. Fortress Dragon, I don't know why it says A, it should be B, but Fortress Dragon is still reasonably strong because, like I mentioned, you have three skill boosts and then three turns of haste when you transform into Dark Magician Girl. So your mono dark farming teams or even mono light teams like this because you enter the dungeon, pop various active skills, re-haste them back up, and then you transform into something with a three turn cooldown, which is pretty exciting because now you can have another orb generator later on in a given dungeon. It just makes your life much easier overall. Great for farming purposes, and in fact, it's actually not a bad sub for your Yugi teams because Fortress Dragon gives you six effective skill boosts, and Yugi needs 20 to transform. So you can get there with reasonable ease. Two Fortress Dragons is not a terrible thing to run on a given team. When this collab first came out, two Fortress Dragons and Dark Magician were like, bam, you've got a Yugi team. Like, it was pretty interesting. You still can definitely do so at this point in time. Their weapon assist gives you an attack wall above 50%, as well as two team RCV awakenings, and they do make hazards and hearts to fire, as well as 75% damage reduction for one turn. You do need damage reduction for Shura 2 and 3, so it's not a bad thing. It gives you more healing, gives you more personal damage for the owning card. It's actually not that bad of a weapon assist overall. It may not be as flashy as other things, but it's still actually reasonably decent overall. But just be mindful of the fact that you do take away hard orbs, which means you may not be able to heal, which may or may not be an issue for when you tank that large hit. But 75% damage reduction is probably enough to let you to survive anyways. And then now we come to Karibo. And Karibo, in their weapon assist is what I want to look at because that's the only form that truly matters. Because in their weapon assist, they give you an L and two skill binder resist. So two skill binder resist is situationally useful. But with all the prowess of the fairies going on, skill binder resist is valuable because most of the fairies lack skill binder resist. So you may need to cover quite a bit in a given card. Even if you only need to cover one skill binder resist, it's not bad because if you take advantage of the L, it's now a meaningful weapon assist already because you did need an L. But it, the fun doesn't stop there you get a eight turn cooldown that gives you five turns of 30 percent damage reduction so that 30 percent damage reduction may be enough to let you survive those enraged hits and sure a two three you have the skill binder resist to cover the shortcomings for your fairy teams you have an l unlock which helps you deal with locked orbs quite a few nice utility abilities within this one weapon assist and even with my reasonably deep monster box 
I still use Karibo's weapon assist from time to time because it's covering such a unique combination, but it's not just unique, it's unique but relevant at the same time. So, should you roll? If you have never rolled before, I highly recommend you do roll so at this point in time because there is value to be found at all given rarities and they give weapon assist. So, if you haven't rolled, there's a good chance you're possibly a newer player because the previous run was like a year and a half or so ago and you would are now possibly a newer player and you can definitely plug a lot of new holes in your monster box. For someone like myself, it's much harder to justify rolling because we've already done so in the past and I've got all the bottom rarity many times. Like there are still six cards, six starter cards out there and they do comprise 50% of the rolling pool. So like, I feel like I will still roll, but not roll as hard as someone who hasn't done so before. Cause I don't want like my fifth or sixth Karibo. Like they're cool and all, but like, I don't want them to multiply so much. Either way, with that being said, let me know what you think about this event overall in the comments down below. Do you think it's worth rolling in despite the fact that it has come beforehand and you may have already done so in the past? And if you did end up rolling, did you roll something meaningful? That being said, hopefully you all have a truly fantastic day. I wish you all the very best of luck in your own pad adventures and happy puzzling.